Welcome back to RSA 2024. Come on inside theCUBE. We're here at Broadcast Alley in Moscone West. Dave Vellante with Shelly Kramer. Matt Radelek is here, he's the Vice President of Incident Response and Cloud Operations at Veronis. Matt, good to see you, thanks for coming in. Great to be here, thanks in for having from, me on the show. You're welcome, in from DC this morning. We're going to talk about keeping AI from exposing data and how to reduce your AI blast radius. Yeah, AI, it's just the <laughs> more tech we get, the bigger the threat surface becomes, right? Explain yeah. your premise here. Sure, I, I think if you just look at uh, you know, what is the blast radius, right? Take, take the average employee of your organization, pull them out of their seat and answer the question, how much can they get to? What we find at Veronis is that it's often way too much data. You know, and even Microsoft says people only use about 1% of the permissions that they're granted. Yeah. Okay, so how do you guys help solve that problem? Yeah, we have a lot of automation to help organizations first understand what that blast radius is, and then start to prune it back automatically. So we have a policy-based automation engine. What we can do is take data that might have been shared to your whole organization and keep the people that have been using the data and preserve their access, but prune all the people that weren't using that access. So we can get to that least privilege model, or I like to call that just right permissions model, pretty easily. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, that cool. And now have you been over to the Actually, I'm not sure it's open yet in North. Is the exhibit hall open so. yet? I was able to check out our booth, and you know, we just went through a rebrand, so you can see like everything. I mean, we are really making a statement. As soon as you get off the escalator, you can't miss the Veronis booth. Well, so what's the premise of your presentation? Sure, Basically, the, the, the idea is that a lot of organizations, they look at like protecting data as something that they either need to do in motion or on their endpoints, right. but they're not looking at like their data warehouses, almost like a bank looks at a vault. Right, like we all do business with banks. I'm sure every one of your, your viewers or listeners has got a, a credit card or something like that. You want to do it with a trusted bank. They use lots of security. They have stuff like fraud detection. We need to start treating our data the same way. Like it's yeah. one of our most valuable assets and really focus our security attention on the vault as opposed to on these little endpoints, which I equivalent out to like ATMs. Sure, there's some juicy information on there and they need to be secured, but your vault is where like the treasure trove of information exists and the vault is also what AI is going to mine. Yeah. And so when I say the vault, I mean stuff like your Amazon object storage, your Microsoft 365, there's probably 100 storage vendors here selling storage arrays, yeah. you know, all the data that you put on those storage arrays. These, these are your, your corporate vaults. So I, think, I feel like it is just a matter of getting your arms around a, a new practice, if you would. Like, I remember a few um, years ago, we so when we would hire somebody, we would talk specifically about what kind of password access they need. What kind of, you know, Dave needs this, Matt needs this, Shelly needs this, that, and you didn't get anything that didn't make sense for you to need to do your job. But I feel like maybe that hasn't been our approach in cybersecurity up until now. Yeah, and, and, and definitely not for data, right? No, I mean, absolutely not. People have thought like, okay, we're not going to give admin credentials to everyone, right. but they're not thinking about that same like, well, should we give everyone access to all of our data? Yeah. And what, what that does is that makes a ransomware actor or a cyber criminal able to just not have to do anything sophisticated, right? right? They only need to drop malware to get privileges. The door's if they open. can get to 99% <laughs> of the data with a regular user account, yeah. they don't need sophisticated tools to access and exfiltrate information. Now take that same problem and that's magnified by AI because of these co-pilots. You know, we, we, hopefully you guys have tried out one yeah. of these co-pilots, ask it to go to a meeting for you or summarize things. Yeah. Well you can also say, show me some interesting information or Tell me about the upcoming mergers and acquisitions, and if that data is open, like I talked about before, it often is, yeah. the co-pilot has access to it as well. So it really removes that layer of obscurity that's there for regular users and regular right. employees. Yeah, makes perfect sense. So speaking of co-pilots, you have a Microsoft partnership. It's interesting. I, I wonder how you feel about this, Matt, because I, I feel like if, if consumers get value out of something, that value will trump any concerns they have over cyber. So the example I was using, so, when the whole open AI kerfuffle came out, I was like, wow, I wonder if this is going to slow down the adoption of, of co-pilots because it's so, you know, open AI and, and, and they fired the CEO, he came back, blah, 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 all that sort of drama. None of it mattered. Yeah. Co-pilot adoption is going through the roof. You talk to people, they're like, oh, this is awesome. I use it for, for coding assistance. I use it for summarizing documents. It's, it's helping me with my, my workflow. So, that's amazing to me, that, and, and it's always sort of been the pattern, but what's the relationship with Microsoft? How are you guys sort of yeah. going to market together? 
there are a lot of organizations that roll, do that initial pilot with Copilot, and Microsoft's pushing that really heavy right yeah, now, right. and they should. I mean, it's a really awesome productivity tool that everyone should use. It's just that there's this balance that people strike. As soon as they start to test it, they realize if they didn't get their data security right before, it's now a problem. It's a problem that is like front and center, stopping their business from moving forward with this Copilot until they can secure it. And that's really the foundation of the partnership with Microsoft. Microsoft's going to turn those clients to us and say, look, this customer, they really want to move forward with Copilot, that's a huge opportunity for us, but we need you to help them you know, get their data in line or, or you know, get their data in check, get that blast radius really limited, and also police the prompts. So I think the other side of the equation is whether you have open data or locked down data, you do need to monitor how your users are using these Copilots and not just let them run rampant. Right, right. Well, and that's a nice sales motion. I mean, for you, if what Microsoft does is say, here we yeah, have a hey, customer. Yeah, hey, you definitely win. need to solve this security problem before you move <laughs> okay. forward. Okay. And, I mean, that's a huge problem for Microsoft, right? That's a business problem for Microsoft, which I think makes the partnership make yeah. a lot of sense. One of the biggest names, if not the biggest name in data security, and the automation that we bring to the table can just help Microsoft customers get there faster and get there with more automation. What's on the uh, CISO's checklist? Top priorities, I mean, they've got like 20 of them, but what are the top two or three? I think right now the number one is enabling AI. It isn't stopping it, it's how do I get my business to benefit from it by providing that like just right balance of security and productivity. I think number two is, you know, like what threat actors do I actually need to be concerned about? Right, like cybercrime, especially if you're in healthcare right now, or if you're in critical infrastructure with like the state actors like Volt Typhoon, definitely need to be aware of that. But I think the third thing is, how am I leveling up my team with AI? Because if you're sitting and focusing only on the business benefits and not on the security benefits, you're missing an, an opportunity for your own security personnel. Like whether that's automated investigations or AI powered or AI enabled SOC or AI enabled search. There are so many things that can get our security analysts and our incident responders the benefits of AI alongside of our business like and our productivity users, our sales employees, our coders, as you so eloquently stated. You mean, when you say automated investigations, you mean like pen testing or? Uh, the, the sky's the limit. I'm sure if you spend enough time on the floor, you'll see someone that's got an AI for everything. But how Veronis is using AI is really in two ways. One, we want to make it easier to use our software for new users. So we have Athena AI, which is an AI assisted search. So if you're trying to make a search query, you can use natural language, and that'll translate it to the Veronis query language for you. So you don't have to actually know how to use our product to get data out of it. We have AI to help you with that. The second pillar is the AI-powered SOC. So we're providing automated playbooks, so if a SOC analyst doesn't know how to deal with a particular threat, they can engage with our AI-powered SOC, and they can figure out how to thwart a particular threat. Now many of our clients are turning to us for that, and letting Veronis' managed data detection and response watch after their data for them, but for the clients that elect to do it themselves, they're getting a lot of value from that AI-assisted SOC. And part of this is also then that you can put somebody that is not a senior from a security standpoint, give them these yeah, tasks give them because they're, they're right. working alongside the technology that's, well that's really cool. That's right, and it also helps like, you know, lower that barrier to entry to cybersecurity. Yeah. We can pull more people over from more business analyst roles yeah. or technology roles and make them analysts by giving them these AI assistive tools. Yeah. I was joking with one so of your changing. colleagues um, that you guys, actually before I go there, hmm. how will the SOC analyst experience change as a result of AI? Question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I have two major predictions here. One is that we're actually going to level up the SOC so much that what we call L1 SOC today, which are by and large people that only operate by playbooks, right? they just follow you know, standard operating procedures, I think they're going to go away because the AI, especially at Veronis, is our AI is, is that person now, yeah. right? Like that level one sock that only follows a script is all done by the robots now, it's not done by humans. So our analysts have to be even more of experts to be able to process the things that the robots couldn't, and I think we're going to see more and more of that, while at the same time, exactly what we were just talking about, we're going to lower the entry point for people into the industry, yeah. and so that skills gap is only going to get bigger as a result, because you're going to need analysts that can work with AI, and have already been leveled up by AI, and they're going to be trying to bring people in using all these AI powered tools. So AI is going to increase the skills gap? Wow, that's, yeah. that's a non-intuitive prediction, but it actually makes some sense, what you're basically saying. I mean, in the beginning, it lowers it, because you're bringing people yeah. to a new technology, but in the end, like that layer one role, it's kind of, it's kind of been eliminated. Right, right, so the, now you're attacking some of the really hard to attack problems, 
Um, wow. And I think you'll see other cybersecurity companies like a, Ver like a Veronis tackle that, have to tackle that problem first, as you know, we're often the ones providing our, you know, the usage of our software on behalf of our customers. So, you know, I was joking with some of your colleagues, that this is like, RSA especially is like acronym soup. No, there's no industry that's worse than security <laughs> on, a, on acronyms, but, so you guys are data. You can just insert another D for data into any acronym, so MDR. That's right. Make, just call it MDDR, so explain <laughs> your angle on that. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, why do we call it managed data detection and response? First and foremost, companies have a hard time answering the question, is my data safe? Was it accessed or exfiltrated during this event that transpired? And do we have a duty to report or is it material, which for any publicly traded company is top of mind for like every CFO right, right. now. And so this service aims to help you answer those questions first and then layer on the other parts of the ecosystem. So someone that has an MDR from another provider would still tremendously benefit from an MDDR that's focused just on their data. What am I going to learn from your little breakout session and the talk that you're going to 20 minutes, that's 20 minutes, you can get some yeah. detail there. What, what, what are folks going to learn and why should they attend? I think they're going to learn a few things about how to catch today's cyber criminals and how stopping cyber crime is also going to help you prevent an AI data breach. Two, they're going to get a very practical approach in order to deal with AI. And it really is what I said earlier, I'll, I'll, I'll spill away some of the secrets now, <laughs> which is you, you need to treat your data in these vaults just like you would the crown jewels. And you need to think about monitoring it and locking it down there, because the further that you get from these vaults, the harder it becomes to control this information. And so I'll, I'll make a lot of, I'll make a very strong point about if you do that and you police the prompts, obviously in a much more eloquent way, maybe with a few stories and jokes along the way, that you'll be able to successfully avoid a data breach caused by AI. It's funny what you're saying about the vaults and the ATMs. You know, why, do we, why do you rob a bank? Well, because that's where the money is. Yeah, that's where the money and is. So the money in ATMs, but a lot more money in the vaults. And the vault today is data. That's People right. are grabbing your data. We've, we've talked a lot. We've seen how it's not only encrypting the data in, in ransomware, it's exfiltrating it so that if you can you know, use some kind of air gap and get your data back, well, I still have your data, I'm going to release it, so you better pay me or you're really going to be embarrassed, your stock price is going to get hit, you know, your employees are going to be embarrassed, your, your customers are going to freak out, you're going to get sued. Okay, and now you've ransom. got the infighting between the different providers. We, we look at Change Healthcare and Optum where they pay the ransom to provider number one, but then they didn't pay the cut of the ransom to provider number two, so provider number two's got their hand out, and they're asking for, for part of their ransom before they post some of the data online. It's like a never-ending cycle. But just think about it, the same problem that causes a breach like that your AI now has the same level of access as that attacker. So you, now you're, you took the need to be sophisticated away from the attacker, they can just use the co-pilot to make prompts and retrieve back information from all of your connected applications. So it's really going to become like a, the, the data exfiltration on steroids. Yeah. So the consensus last year at RSA 23 was that initially the, def, the, the attackers are going to have the advantage with AI and then I, I, it was mixed as to whether or not the defenders would ever get an advantage, but for those who felt like the defenders would get an advantage, it was also mixed. Some felt that the gap would be compressed within a year to 18 months, others felt like it might take you know, three or four years, nobody really knows. It, it feels like based on your comments, Matt, that that gap has not closed in the last 12 months. No, and I don't think it ever will. I don't either. Um, as long as we are, the primary reason behind AI is to boost productivity, right, to actually like make our workforce more productive and more innovative, the, the, the cyber criminals are always going to win because they're going to use those tools for their own productivity and their own gains, and secure, AI for security will always be the second thing. It won't be as big of an industry. Security is not as big of an industry as businesses. You right. said, I don't either, why? why? Well, you... no, and we talked about this earlier today with somebody else, and I feel like, you know, I use this analogy all the time, we're playing a game of whack-a-mole, and it's, you know, I got this one, and I got this one, and I got this one, and I don't care how great our technology is, the thing about, uh, the thing about AI, Gen AI in particular, is that cyber criminals are not dumb and they clearly see <laughs> what the benefits here are. And so, you know, for those of us in the business world thinking about how we're going to use Gen AI, and it's like, oh Dave, we got to make sure we have guardrails in place, you know, and our team needs to know these rules. You know what I'm saying? Like, all of these boxes that we have to check because we got to get things right. Cyber criminals have one goal, to make money. Yeah. And the quicker they can get 
their arms around this, the quicker they can get things launched and everything else, the more money they stand to make. So, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we're operating at one speed and they're operating at another speed and their, their benefit, their upside is so high. Yeah, I don't and see Cybercrime it has become a huge business, right? Like, you have these initial access brokers that, you know, farm the phishing emails and get the footholds, yeah. then they turn it over to the ransomware actors. A lot of these ransomware actors are state backed, you know, by like, you know, sophisticated yeah. people writing the code for them. Yeah. And so, it, can, can we really keep Keep up, right? I'll tell you this though, I don't envy the job of the CISO right now. Oh gosh, right? no. They have to get everything right, and the attackers only have to find the one thing that you got wrong. One thing you and forgot. And that makes it really, really <laughs> hard to be a CISO right now. Well, and I think I've read somewhere that like the term, the job, the job term that you know people spend in a job is like a year and a half, two yeah, years, months. something like that. I mean, it's I don't know how most of them sleep. I mean, there's so much responsibility, and then when you see things like you know CISOs getting charged as a result of a and the personal liability and all of that, it's a lot. Yeah, it's a tall order, and I hope a lot of them are here to see kind of the, this dichotomy yeah. between you know I'll say this. AI is the biggest opportunity that we have, but also the biggest threat to our organizations. Yeah. And I think for a CISO, not doing it is the biggest threat to your livelihood. Yeah. Not embracing AI as something that's going to boost your business's productivity, and being someone that holds that back is probably the biggest threat that someone could face this year, because you could lose your business to your competitors that just use AI. Right. Well, and to your point, Shelly, the, the, the attackers, they're, they're trying to make money, that's why they do it. You know, there are, I know there are other reasons, like nation state but, stuff, but to make money. So, to the extent, you know, ROI, it's benefit over cost. If you can reduce their benefit and increase their cost, they're going to go to another bank. Right. They're going to go to another vault. Yeah. So, Matt, good luck with your yeah, presentation. Thanks so much, When guys. is it tomorrow? It's on Wednesday. Wednesday. And I want to say at 3.30, uh, yeah. And how to prevent your first AI data breach. Awesome, Excellent. well good luck with that. Love to have you back at some point. And uh, thanks for coming to theCUBE. Yeah, thanks guys, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, you bet. All right, keep it right there, we're back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE live from RSA 2024. We're at Moscone West, and we'll be right back.